So um, we're going to talk about the, the Chinese ancestor Shi Tu a little bit this morning. Um, and Shi Tu is, uh, I'm more familiar with his Japanese name, Sekito Kizen. Um, and which will, I'll mention his name a little bit later on. So um, I was thinking about, I, I, I understood that that Matsu that we talked about last time and 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 Shitu were contemporaries. So I was I was puzzling about how how do they fit on the, on our lineage chart? Um, and you know when I first saw the lineage chart, it was given to me when I received the precepts. Um, it, it, this is this is what it looks like. And maybe you could zoom in a little bit more closely, Patty. I'll move out of the way. There, there you can see the, the beautiful flowers. Okay. So yes, yeah, zoom, yeah, a little more, pull it in a little more. So this this is this is a lineage chart, you know, starting up here with Shakyamuni Buddha right here at the top, and then winding around. There, there are red lines that you can't see very well on screen, winding all the way down here to um, to here to my name and then my, then my student's name here at the very at the very bottom, and um, so I never really looked at it very very closely to be honest. I mean, I saw Shakyamuni and I saw my name; those were the most important ones, obviously. <laughs> and um, so so I thought I better look at it this morning because I you know to figure out how is how is it that contemporaries were you know are on this lineage chart um, because I thought it was a you know a um, teacher to student to teacher to student etc all the way down in an unbroken lineage that was my fantasy even though I know I had been told that it, that it um, you know some of it had probably been made up a little bit you know because record keeping maybe wasn't as um, assiduous as ours is now, although the Chinese are very are excellent record keepers. And anyway, um, so it, it's, as I said, it turns out not to be quite that simple. Um, scholars have found that lineage charts were actually compiled somewhat gradually, um, mainly to try to verify the validity of various schools of Chinese Buddhism and What's mostly um, of, you know relevant to us are the schools of of Chan Buddhism, um, la later known as Zen in Japan, and, um, and 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 in particular the two um, remaining most predominant schools of Zen, which are Rinzai and Soto, uh, and we are in the Soto Zen lineage. So um, they weren't always strictly accurate. Um, and and um, so as a, as a matter of fact, uh, Matsu and Shitu were taught by two different stu students of we know that we that we um, you know have already have already studied. So what happens is right down here is here's here's Shakyamuni. Can you see this? And here's here's we know. These are all all the the Indian ancestors, and the Indians could have, um, kept good records too, not as good as the chat of the Chinese. So some of these might be historic historically accurate. So here comes here comes um, we know, and then right under we know is is Dogen. Well, we know lived lived in the eighth century, and Dogen lived in the thirteenth century. So there's a little gap there. You know what I mean? So. Um, so here's here's um, so this is what happens that I that I found out today. Here's Winung, and then uh, at, over here on this side is Winung's student um, Warong, and then here's Matsu right there. And on the other side is um, I can't read the first name very well, but um, Xingxi, and then here's Shitu over here. So the Chinese ancestors wind down on two sides like this, all the way down like that, and then I go up here at to to Dogen. They frame both sides, frame Dogen, and then then there are the Japanese ancestors like that. 
And partly that reflects that Duggan had more than one teacher, as, as many people do. But, um, but Dharma transmission is only given by, by one teacher. And um, I'm sure that, that, that this, was, this, this pattern um, had its controversies because, um, you know, the, when, when um, you know, remembering the stories about Wee Nung and he received the, the robe and the bowl from his teacher and that was the designation of, of Dharma transmission. And, and we, they, we still do that now, but, but nowadays many people receive the, the robe and the bowls. So, um, and I, I suspect that that, all, that happened in the past as well, because, um, because of these varying lineages that, that, um, that we can see at least two of them on, on our lineage chart. So um, I remember, actually, I remember Sojin Mel Weitzman, um, who is the late abbot of Berkeley Zen Center, saying that formally, Zen masters only gave Dharma transmission to one person and that he gave it to 20. So in fact, um, maybe he also had this notion that our, our lineage chart was, you know, was accurate, but um, but actually, probably, you know, there's a lot more going on in, than, than the lineage chart reveals. In any case, um, getting back to Shi Tu, um, Shi Tu and Matsu were contemporaries, they, living about almost entirely the whole uh, 8th century. And, um, and in the book, um, that, and it, there grew up to be a, um, a legend about them that they, that they um, knew of each other and that they used to send send students back and forth between the two of them and that and that uh, later students felt that if uh, or teachers perhaps felt that to be fully um, trained as a as a Zen monk, you had to study with each of them. Um, but in fact, that is that's that does not seem to be true that scholars um, have su subsequently found that they um, probably that that did not actually happen, um, and it's but it but it reflects the influence that each of their traditions and, and what followed them have been in, influential in Japanese Zen. Um, And, and also perhaps reflects the reality that I mentioned before that, um, that students did and still do study with more than one teacher, uh, becoming kind of itinerant you know, from time to time. Anyway, that's just a little digression before we we're, we're talking about Chi Tu, um, just, to, just to figure out how we can, we can be descended from both Matsu and she too. And also there were, you know, there are clear differences in their teaching and in their um, style of living, because Matsu seems to have lived and and um, uh, and taught in a monastic community, while she too, she too was a hermit. Um, and and clearly um, she too's manner of teaching seems to have been much more mild. Um, Jiryu Abel's, which is where I'm, where I'm deriving some, a lot of this, these things that I'm talking about, um, says that Chitu lived in a mountainous area of Hunan province, which is a, was an area that had, um, had several Buddhist monasteries, as well as um, Taoist and Confucian centers. And he built himself a small hut on a, on a rock, which is what his name is derived from where he lived and meditated and gradually people began to visit him and seek his teaching. And it's said that he composed um, the great poem that's known in, in Japanese as the Sandokai to express the depth of his understanding that he gained um, on reading the words of the fourth century sage, sage Seng Zhao. And I'm, I'll read that to you. Um, so, 
<clears throat> so Seng Zhao had, had written, the ultimate man is empty and hollow. He has no form, yet of the myriad things, there is none that is not his own making. Who can understand the myriad things as oneself? Only a sage. To which she too added, a sage has no self, yet there is nothing that is not himself. Um, and this is, it's interesting because I've often felt that every successive teaching is just a restatement of the Heart Sutra. But it's it's restatement in which the 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 writer or the person in the story has taken that teaching, the, the depth teaching of the Heart Sutra into that into his or her own life and expressed it uniquely. And that's the nature of the transmission. Is it that is that it must be you can you can read these words and you can tell these stories and they're they're just intellectual or just stories until you've taken the teaching into your own body and your own life and had a deep realization. So so he composed the great poem the Sandokai um, in uh, in a restatement of his of his understanding. And I first studied the Santa Kai when I was Shu Tso in, in 2007. I, I asked Grace if I could take it on as a study project because I, I wanted to challenge myself with something that at the time was completely incomprehensible to me. I, had, I just could not, I had no idea what it was about. And uh, that year, it was either that year um, or, or possibly the previous year, and maybe Bruce remembers this, we went to Japan with Grace for, the, for I think it was the second time, and um, we stayed at Rinzo Inn, which is a temple complex in a, in a small town on the coast, on the west coast of Japan, um, which is where, which was Shinra Suzuki's, Suzuki Roshi's um, home temple, and his son and grandson were in residence there, and his son, Hoitsu Suzuki, taught us to chant the Sandokai in Japanese, which of course, you know, expanded my understanding of the, of the, of the poem greatly. But actually, I, I kind of continued to fall in love with it because it's very, it's very beautiful when it's chanted in Japanese. And, but the only thing I can remember of how to chant um, it in Japanese is how to chant the title because, because I was the, um, a Kokyo at that time, so I had to learn how to do that. And so I'm going to, I'm going to chant it the way um, Huitsu Suzuki taught to do it. So I have to take my mask off to do, to do this. Sando kai ee, like that. So um, you can see that we don't quite do that here <laughs> or anymore. I, I have heard um, the Kokyo at Tassahara chant like that. But it seems a bit, it seems a bit, you know, out of place here. But we learned to, tra to tra chant it with that kind of emphasis and that kind of heart and commitment, you know, not laconically as the way we tend to do in the US. And I think there's something to be said for that because there's something about, um, taking all of these teachings that are um, contained in the Heart Sutra, in the Metta Sutta, and not just mindlessly saying them, but, um, but committing ourselves to feeling them in our body, committing ourselves to them in the body, heart, and mind. And, um, so I, I want to kind of try a little bit of an experiment today. And um, because like the transmission of the, of the practice and of the Buddha's teaching, it's not until it enters your life that 
it, it makes a difference. So I thought, so I'm, um, so Patty is going to put up, and I have hard copies here for you guys if you want. Um, she's going to put up a screen share of it so you can see it. What was that? Do you have one? Okay. Patty, do you want one? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so we will, however, we'll just, we will just recite it and not chant it. But I'll start by saying the Sandokai Sekhto Kizen, and then we'll, we'll say it together and we'll do it very slowly. So, so while we're doing that, pay full attention to each line and then notice how your, how each line feels in your body and what comes up for you. Notice what catches your attention. Notice what's strange or provocative or mysterious. It doesn't notice you can you can spend time thinking about the meaning. That's fine too, but see if you can attend to it in a different way. So let's let's start that. So I'll start and then we'll say it together. The Sandokai of Sekito Kizen. The mind of the great sage of India was conveyed intimately from west to east. There are differences in human personality. Some are clever and some are not. The teachers of the north and south are but different expressions of the same reality. The spiritual source shines clearly in the light. Branching streams flow in the darkness. To be attached, this is delusion. Oh, to things, this is delusion. But just to understand that all is one is not enough. Each and all the elements of the subjective and objective spheres are interdependent and at the same time independent, related, though each thing keeps its own place. Form makes the character and appearance different. Pleasure and suffering appear unrelated. The dark makes all forms one. In brightness, dualistic distinctions become apparent. The four elements return to their nature like a child to its mother. Fire is hot, wind moves, water is wet, earth hard. I see, ears hear, the nose smells, the tongue tastes salt and sour. Each is independent of the other, but the different leaves come from the same root. The words high and low are used relatively. Within the light there is darkness, but do not be attached to that darkness. Within the darkness there is light, but do not be caught by that light. Light and darkness are a pair, like the foot before and the foot behind in walking. Each thing has its intrinsic value and is related to everything else in function and position. Ordinary life fits the absolute as a box and its lid. The absolute works together with the relative, like two arrows meeting in mid-air. Reading the above lines, you should have grasped the great reality. Do not set up your own standards. If you do not see the way, you do not see it, though you are actually walking on it. When you walk the way, it is not here, it is not far. If you are deluded, you are mountains and rivers away from it. I say respectfully to those who seek the way, do not vainly pass through sunshine and sad shadows. So now um, take a moment to find the line that caught your attention. And Patty, maybe you could scroll a little bit so people can see the whole thing. There's a way to make that smaller, I'm not sure. 
So just take a moment to let your attention fall on the thing that stands out the most. Or the thing that's the most puzzling or the thing that makes you irritated or the thing that makes you just want to throw it, throw it in the trash. Or the thing that you find beautiful or interesting. So if, you, if you're at home, um, take a moment to jot down what's, what's, what caught your eye and um, so that we can, right now we, we can only see you here in thumbnails and we can't see everybody. So we'll take the screen share off in a minute. So, so take a second to find what the place that caught your attention the most. And just write it down. <laughs> <laughs> 